Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 7. Luke 7. This evening is going to be Luke chapter 7. It's going to be in verses 11 through 17 this evening. And I'm going to read it to you before we get started. It says this. Luke says... Soon afterward, he, talking about Jesus, went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near the, to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died had, was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and the town was with him. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. And then he came up and touched the briar and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all. Arisen among us, has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout the whole of Judea and all the country. Lord, there are some potent messages that you want to speak to us today. You are the God of compassion. every broken heart fused the mind and you and you hold close and father show compassion as we've that you will within your church lord Some who show unusual compassion. Some who are not afraid or intimidated by that which is the most broken in the world. And by those who don't deserve that compassion. To see and give us most of all, Lord God, those who are here this morning or this afternoon, Lord, and need to be comforted. Holy Spirit, you are a comforter. Draw near to them. Draw near to them. For you know every weight on every heart. For you are good. And so, Lord, be glorified. I was driving on the freeway and and as I was driving down the freeway, I remember the day, I remember the mirror, and it was a man in a three-piece suit walking down the and no one stopped to pick him up. Odd enough that it was raining, but it was even more odd the way that the man was dressed. You see, sometimes when you're in the city, especially in a, in a downtown area, you will see people who obviously look like something is wrong. Um, you can tell that they had arrived at a point in their lives where life was they may be There may be some mental But this man was clean cut. This man had perfect shoes. I remember seeing his shoes. I was like, those are new shoes on, that he has on. And so I hit the turnaround, and something told me to go and pick him up. Now, I've picked up some weirdos in my life. Okay. Here was unique. 
behind him and I honked my horn and he stopped and he turned around and he looked directly at me and I you know, signal that he can come and get in the car. And he gets in the car and I remember his hair was, was drenched, his, his suit was drenched. He had a white shirt on. You can see that it was transparent from the moisture at this time. And I said, hey man, how are you doing? And he looks at me and he said, did the Holy Spirit tell you to stop and get me? And I said, uh, and he says, I'm in New Braunfels. From to New Braunfels, it's about a 35 minute car ride. He's walking in the rain. And I said, man, that is a long walk. He said, I know, but the Holy Spirit got me up, and there's a sister at our church. I need to go and pray for her. And I said, bro, that is amazing. And so did Jesus tell you to put on this suit here? He said, no, this is how I dress. I said, wow. For this lady, I was late to class, and we are on our break, and I couldn't believe it because, you know, of my friends were like, hey, man, you were really late to class. You kind of missed. I was like, hey, man, well, give me your notes, man. You got to give me your notes. The whole this man did not allow anything to stop him from doing what he believed God asked him to do. It didn't stop him. Distance didn't stop him. Stop him. The fact that he didn't have a car did not stop him. The weather did not stop him. All he knew was that there was a woman in his church that needed prayer and he wanted to be there to pray for her. And I dropped him off at a nursing home and he went right in as if he was just on a mission. And when we here, we see a mission. Jesus is on a mission to go somewhere that the kingdom was not expecting him to go. Here is Jesus rushing to go to a funeral. And so it says in verse 11, soon afterward, he went to Nain and his disciples and a great crowd was with him. Now, you remember last time we were together, Jesus had miraculously healed the servant of a centurion. In fact, he didn't even have to be there. The centurion was the man of what? Great faith. He had shown more faith that, than Jesus had seen in his living life and his ministry to the Jews during this time. And Jesus just commends him for this great faith that he had. But it says that soon afterward, and we'll notice that, you know, this is a time period after this had happened. In a few days, he went to a called Nain, and his disciples were with him, and it's a great large multitude that are with him. Now, Nain is not just down the street. You remember when Jesus shared the, the Sermon on the Mount, he just went to Capernaum. Capernaum was right there. This here is not a short walk. Nain is about 20 miles south of a full This is for terrain and other obstacles that are there. And a large multitude of people were traveling with him. In fact, Nain still exists today. It's a small town. It has about 200 or so people that are there. And so you can still go there and visit this place journeyed. But the fact is, is that Jesus describes or is the embodiment of what we call divine purpose. When that man was walking on that freeway, he had a purpose. When Jesus is traveling, he has a purpose. It means that God has a plan upon the earth. And when Jesus was here, foresee, or he was going to, 
Jesus in no way would be what God Spirit was the one that got him. And he came to some very interesting places. But it shows us that God always acts with a fixed purpose in mind. God never is impulsive. When you pray to God and God answers your prayers, it's never out of fear. It's never out of thinking that it's not going to work. God is not impulsive. He doesn't deal with luck or livelihoods or likelihoods. Everything within the plan of God is fixed, it's settled, and it's unchanging. He's sovereign. He has perfect intentions. He thinks and he acts, and everything that he thinks and everything that he acts upon happens. His mission is clear. He has a clear objective. He has clear strategy every single time he makes a plan. In other words, there are, no, there are never, ever any random thoughts in the mind of God. He, he's not like us. He's always focused Nothing pops into God's mind, and nothing pops out of his mind. He, he doesn't have to remember anything, nor does he forget anything. Everything is purposeful, planned, unchangeable, and settled. God's goals are always fulfilled. Always. Isaiah says this in Isaiah chapter 46. He says, remember the former things long past, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done so, saying, my purpose will be a The man of my purpose operates perfectly as he has established it to. And so this is where we seen in Jesus. Jesus operated, lived, and ministered with the same holy purpose and the same holy, direct, driven resolve in everything that he did. In John chapter 4, verse 4, it says, and he had to pass through Samaria. The, the worship team meeting that we had today, we talked about John 4. through Samaria. Samaria was a place where Jews did not go. In fact, they went all the way around Samaria to avoid talking or interacting with Samaritans. Jesus had to go because the plan was set. There was a woman that he had to meet at a well who was there. He had to. It was days drew near for him to be taken demonstrating the very nature of God. He knows where he's going. He knows what's going to happen. He gets there, even though, the, even though the people that he will meet don't know it, he still does it. He's always moving. Nothing is accident. It is accident. There is no happenstance in your life. There is no luck in your life. Everything in your life, every breath, every heartbeat, every eye blink, every step is ordained and orchestrated by the Lord. So here's God in action. He had to go to this funeral. And I don't know how many of you, if somebody woke up and said, we have to go to this funeral, you would be happy. I know I wouldn't. I'd be kind of creeped out. The only guy that a funeral is good for is the pallbearer. But here's Jesus, and he has to go to a funeral because the Holy Spirit is leading him there. He has this large... He's resolute to go to this town of Nain. He's been with intentionality, but he goes there because of the purposeful plan of God to encounter this funeral. In verse 12, it says, as he drew near to the gate of the town. And so he sees the town. Everybody's with him, sees this town. 
And they would say, that's where we're going. Well, something is happening here. Behold, a man who had died was being carried. The only child from the town was with her. This is God's plan here. This is God's plan. Jesus leaves at the exact time that he needed to in order to intercept this funeral. If he had left any earlier, the young boy wouldn't have have died yet. Jesus knew when he had died. And so now you have a great multitude coming to the town and they're happy and they're jubilant and they're joyful. And then you have a considerable amount of people coming out of and they're somber lot of noise the thing is is that this boy or this young man died that day you see the body would have been wrapped in clothes or in cloth and once death occurred they did it very rapidly and they had the funeral very rapidly buried very quickly keep a point. So it's very possible. Here's Jesus moving towards this procession and he has perfect knowledge about this. He knows the exact time that this boy had died, this young man had died. He knows all of these things. And it takes us to our second thought that Jesus God purpose, but God can orchestrate all of the contingencies. Think about this. God orchestrates every contingency to a choice that you make. He is the one who knows all things, his own purposes. Think about that. That's, that, blows your, that blows my mind Like when I think about it. When I was in third grade, you know, we were really obsessed with pencils. Because he cares. His providence is his control over every human action and every event because it all points to his divine purpose. That's the God that we're dealing with. So when we sing a song, you're singing to the one who controls every facet of reality on every plane of reality, all at once. Jesus was going to name to raise a dead man. That was the only reason that he was going. And when he started out his journey, the man may not have been dead, but Jesus controlled all these issues. He knew when the man died. He knew the timing of the funeral. He knew the service. He knew the mourners that would be there. Providence is perfect timing. The perfect timing that God orchestrates in all of our lives. God knows when to approach the city gate. Jesus knew the perfect timing that this young man would be carried out. He knew the exact split second, the timing, and all of the factors behind this. The man died at the right moment. The mourners were called at the right moment. And in the same way, listen, beloved, God orchestrates your life at the right moment. He knows all things. He, he moves in such a way that you don't have to worry when things are frustrating and when things hurt and when things don't make sense. They make perfect sense to him. When he comes, Jesus knows the heartache of this woman but we have to be comforted with the fact that God knows our heartache. God knows the heaviness of loss. Some of us have lost those whom we love. 
Some of us deal with pain every single day when you remember that person that you lost. When there are no words to comfort. When their memory has passed. When the only time it's brought up is during an anniversary or a birthday or a holiday. The thing is, listen, beloved, God knows these things and he is a comforter. He's a comforter. He has total control. Paul says, listen, for as I passed along and observe the objects of your worship. He's talking to these guys at the Areopagus. He says, I found also an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. And therefore you worship as unknown. This I proclaim to you. Paul would go to Athens. He left, just left Thessalonica. And he's there in Athens. And Athens at this point is not the the, the the center of knowledge that it used to be in the Greek society. But there was these people who stood at Mars Hill. And what they did was they would stand around and they would talk about the things of the day. They would talk about philosophies. They would, you know, argue with one another. They would do all of these things. And so Paul, who couldn't go to the said that on my way here, I noticed that you have gods, you have Zeus, you have Ares, you have all of these gods, you have statues to them. And just in case you missed a god, the last place was empty and it said, to the unknown god. And Paul says, that is where I will start when I talk to these men here. He says something very interesting in verse 24 of chapter 17. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by men. God is not limited to a building. He's, he doesn't live in a building. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Notice what he's doing. He's sharing the gospel. He's not starting from the cross. He's starting from creation. God made all things. He did not create us to fulfill a need. He gives all mankind life and breath. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined, listen, beloved, this is very important because this applies to us. He determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. God knew that you would only seek and find him if you were made here in America, if you were born here in America. He puts you here. He puts you in Alaska. He brought us together. And he says that they should seek God in a hope that they may feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is not actually far from each one of us. He's saying, listen, he put you in a place where you would seek him. He put every person in a place where they would seek him and hopefully find him. In his providence, he knows all things. He orchestrates the affairs of every life. And so Jesus sees this dead man being carried out in this funeral procession. He sees this mother and he sees this family. He sees these mourners and she's leading this procession. And he knows the woman because the text tells us that not only did she lose her only son, but this woman is a what? Widow. This woman died. And then Naomi, and Orpah, and she's like, "Listen, you need to go back to your country. You need to go and to find some life." She's stuck with this old woman 
who was destined to Naomi, jeopardy, because she lost her protector and her husband, and she lost her support and her son. Beloved, this is heartbreaking. It's sad. It's the greatest tragedy that can happen to a family back then because, listen, beloved, there was no social security. How'd you two do? I remember being illegal. And down the hall was an elder couple. And I mean, they were elderly. And, and the woman, I remember, she couldn't stand up straight. What she would do is she would lean over and she would, you know, sweep the floor and she would clean the floor. And, and I had a squat on here, you know, they'll, they'll, and we, we pay them. And I'm thinking, like, we pay them to clean? She's the same age as my grandmother. And that was how they made a living. She was unable to stand straight. She would take piles of American uniforms and starch them and press them. And her husband would clean. This woman here didn't have. her door. And so here she is, broken, has lost everything. And how does Jesus respond? He responds with divine compassion. In verse 13, it says, And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Do not weep. The Greek verb for because what it means is, is that Jesus had a feeling within his insides in his gut. You ever feel that emotion that churns your stomach? It, it, you have a physical reaction to it because it's hurt and it's pain. It, it makes your heart beat. It, it describes affection and compassion. And listen, beloved, this is how Luke describes God. This is how Luke describes the Christ. Of all of the God in our world, there Ever is feeling deep, painful compassion for those whom they love. You know why? Because he knows what you've suffered. And here you see God in human flesh. And he is not a celebrity who ignores the plights of little people to build what is lost. It breaks his heart to see love devastated. He cares about he's a savior in every sense of the word. He even saves those who never believe in him. He saves and rescues them in a temporal way. Because he cares for the world. He feels those who don't even care about him. He gives their life meaning and joys. It's a testament to his life about your joy. He cares about your joy. cares. And touch the briar. And, and the bears still and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. Jesus is so direct with this here. You see, Jesus steps in 
And these Pharisees, these people are watching him. To go into a tent with a dead body makes you ceremonially unclean. Means that you can't go into the tabernacle or you can't go into the temple to worship. You were ritually unclean. But Jesus steps up and not only is in the presence of a dead body, it says that he stepped up and he shows that though he is not a sinner, he enters into the struggle of sinners. Darkness. He just went up and touched it. He stopped the funeral. Can you imagine walking up to a woman getting into a funeral procession, weeping, and you tell her to stop crying? It's insensitive if you can't do nothing about it, isn't it? Stop crying. It's going to be all right. No, no, no. This was our Savior. He was fully aware of what he was about to do. And something happens. It says that the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. The dead man sat up. It wasn't just like, oh, you know, sit up. You know, you ever see people, you know, try to prop somebody up. Like, hey, man, it's you, you're walking. <laughs> it wasn't anything like that. It says that. He was dead, dead. He was unable to stand, but he was also unable to speak. Can you imagine being mom? What do you think the first thing that he said was? I can only imagine that he was probably asking for her. Nobody asked him to do this. There weren't any requests. Was approached by the friends you remember they begged and they said he is worthy for you to do this and so Jesus went with them but the fact is is that the centurion it says that he had faith but it wasn't the centurion's faith that caused Jesus to be able to heal his slave mark that it was not the the fact is, is that people talk on TV and on the internet saying that the reason your life changes is because you don't have enough what? Faith. But Jesus heals here. No request. No faith here is noted at all. Never faith itself that activates his divine power. What activates divine power is God. He doesn't need our faith to do what he wants to do. He's going to do it. And so here he is, who deeply sat up and he began to speak. And notice funeral procession here. It was all of the whalers. It was all of the flute. Following them. Thousands of people that said that fear overwhelmed them. And in that fear, they glorify God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us. And God has visited his people. In verse 17, it says, And the report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all of the surrounding country. Now, fear here means that they were traumatically terrified at what they had saw. Because they knew at that point, in the same way that Peter knew, that thing you are automatically aware that you deserve what to die. Isaiah would say, Woe is me. Woe is me. I am ruined. 
in the presence of God. And can you imagine thousands of people at this point feeling that? Have we ever felt that as a church? Would, would, would our worship change if we felt that? Would you sing, God has visited his people and glorify God? No matter where we are in our lives, the Christ. He cares about the brokenhearted. He cares about those who are crushed in spirit. He cares about you. Listen, it's not even those who are hurting right now from loss who he cares about. Listen, who are you in this? That, that shame has paralyzed you. And you're like, Lord, I, 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 can't, I can't. I don't even know what to do. I don't even know how to pray anymore because I've failed you so badly. I, I've, 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 I've drank so much. I've, I've looked at inappropriate things. I, I've, I've, I've disrespected my, my marriage. I've ignored you. Here is the Christ coming, unflinching, looking, surveying, seeing the failure, seeing the compromise, seeing the darkness, seeing the shame. All of those things. And what does he do? He says, get up. Get up. You may be dead in your sin. You may be dead. But I tell you, power, that's his grace, that's his love, that you can get up and, and you can walk away changed, walk away free, walk away cleansed, because that's who he is. Listen, beloved, it matters not what you've done. We walk away changed so that all in the world, when they see you, they're in awe. Who changes a heart? Who changes a soul? Who, who changes a man? Only he can. Only he can. Jesus raised the dead. Jesus raises the dead. Jesus heals failure. Jesus redeems shame. And Jesus holds everything in your life, no matter where you are, no matter where I am. He is Lord of the world. He is Lord of this church. And so, Father, we come to you right now. With a deep awareness of your power, of your love, of your grace, of thy blood that was shed. And we know right now, Lord, that there is nothing that can separate any of us from your love. You've divinely orchestrated so many things. When we had the opportunity to sin, think back on your week when you, you know, were tempted to lie or tempted to lust or, or 
tempted to do anything. Think about all those times when you were interrupted. And the Lord was there, speaking, convicting, offering love and redemption. And some of us ignored it. It doesn't matter how much you failed, the grace of God is so much stronger. And so, Father, I lift up your people to you. I lift up those, Lord God, who you have divine appointments for, who you've asked to be at a certain place or to do your will in their life. And they haven't trusted you that you've orchestrated all the contingencies. And then I pray for those, Lord, who feel trapped by sin, conquered by shame and hopeless. Jesus, touch them. Sin is May they know the sin-conquering power of Christ. May they walk in it. That when t- temptation comes, You give them the power, as Titus say, says, to say no to sin and ungodliness. To say no to the things that are... ...conquered sin in our lives. And so, Father, I pray right now for strength for victory, for resolve, and for homes now that are built upon a rock. So, Lord, I love you. I thank you for your church. I thank you, Lord God, that you are Lord of this church. And I bless the name.